Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session. Um, so my name is Sergio Prado, and uh, today I'm going to talk about encryption on embedded Linux devices. Um, although my focus here is to um, do some hands-on on embedded Linux, I think this talk um, will be also useful for those that um, develop um, bare metal and um, microcontroller focused um, software. So before we start a little bit about uh, myself, I've been working with Embedded for 25 plus years. Uh, I've been working for the last 10 plus years, I've been working with my company, Embedded Labworks, doing training and consulting. Uh, for the last one year or so, I've been working at Toradex as our software team lead. And uh, I'm also an open source contributor. Uh, I have already contributed to a few open source projects like BuildRoot, Yocto, and the Linux kernel. Sometimes I write some technical stuff at embeddedlinux.org. Uh, feel free to follow me. And um, I have there also my Twitter handle and my LinkedIn account. Feel free to follow me and connect um, with me. Uh, so our agenda today, we have here basically main, um, three main talks to cover. We're gonna start with a quick introduction on uh, security and encryption. Then we're gonna talk about data at rest encryption. So how can we protect the confidentiality of data stored in the device? Um, and the third topic is data internal transit. So how can we protect the confidentiality of data that we send um, that's coming uh, from a server or going to a, a remote server. So um, communication uh, is going to be our focus in the 30 part of this uh, talk. Before we start a few uh, disclaimers, so I'm not an, an expert in cryptography, um, very, very far from that. I've been working uh, with Embedded for several years and I have also been doing a lot of work in terms of security for Embedded devices. Um, and I've been learning a lot, um, but um, especially in the mathematics side of cryptography, I, I I am really not an expert on this, right? But really what I want here is try to demystify this talk to show embedded developers, it's not that hard, uh, the concepts, the ideas, and the tools to work around encryption. Um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna have uh, some nice hands-on here, um, hopefully the demo God's going to be on our side, my side today. So uh, the demos that I want you to show here is going to work. Let's see. Uh, let's start with a quick uh, introduction to security and encryption. So this is uh, an image that's very popular and common, right? That represents the three main principles or aspects of security confidentiality, integrity, and, and availability. And when we think about encryption, we are really talking about protecting confidentiality. So confidentiality is really our main concern here. And uh, according to, to Wikipedia, uh, confidentiality is the property where uh, information, data in general, uh, are not made available to unauthorized uh, individuals, persons, systems, entities, and trajectories, and so on. Why should we care about this on embedded devices? There are a lot of reasons, actually, and uh, I can mention a few of those reasons, like IP protection, right? You may not want someone else from uh, copying and rebranding your device, so you want to protect your IP. Um, you want to protect the data inside the device. Could be because of because you have sensitive information there. Uh, could be because you want to protect the privacy of the users. And sometimes this is um, a requirement, right? You are developing, for example, a medical device, and you need to protect the privacy of the users. Uh, sometimes you want to apply uh, encryption uh, to solve this confidentiality problem because you want to uh, prevent or at least make it harder for people to reverse engineer your device. So that's one idea. Of course, you will not prevent people from doing that, but it will make more difficult for people to, to try to reverse engineer your device. So those are just a few reasons um, why we, we would need to care about confidentiality. And when we think about confidentiality, we, are, we need to think about coding data. So data confidentiality and code confidentiality. 
Data confidentiality, we, we have basically three kinds of data. Data at rest, that's data storing the device, like a flash memory, uh, an SD card, the MMC. Data in transit, that's communication data, data that you send to a remote server or machine or network. And uh, data in use, that's data that you are currently used, like data in RAM memory, data in registers, in the CPU cache. Um, for data use, usually this problem is solved by hardware. Um, now for data in rest, data in transit, we can solve this problem in software. So that's going to be our main focus here how to protect data at rest and data in transit. Now related to code, um, when you think about an embedded Linux device, we have the bootloader, we have the Linux kernel, we have a file system and everything could be protected. But the main question is, do we need to protect all of this, right? For example, the Linux kernel, it's GPLv2. You would need to, have to provide the source code of the kernel for your users if you are developing a device with, with the Linux kernel. So, does it make sense to encrypt the Linux kernel? Probably not. So that, I would say that that's not common, a common requirement on an embedded Linux device to encrypt code. What could happen is that you want to protect your IP, your applications, the code of your application that you have in the device. Um, for that, you could, for example, uh, have a, 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 a small partition with your application inside of it and then encrypt just that partition. That could be one solution, and we're going to cover this this year. Uh, now, another problem with code encryption is uh, uh, licensing in general, and specifically GPLv3, uh, because there is a clause in GPLv3 that says that you need to provide the, the user of your device uh, some kind of mechanism to update GPLv3 software that you have in the device. So if you are encrypting the software, you're going to have to provide your user the keys to decrypt or encrypt their software and update the device. You could work around that, but uh, in the end, uh, it's usually a problem to do that. So um, that's another reason for you to not encrypt, especially open source code that you run the device. Be also aware of um, Secret Boot. Secret Boot doesn't provide any kind of uh, uh, confidentiality. Secret Boot is, is uh, mainly about integrity. So Secure Boot doesn't solve the confidentiality problem. How can we solve the confidentiality problem? I can see at least three ways encryption. So you can encrypt data in the device or code. Um, authorization. So let's say you don't want uh, the, the data to be accessible to everyone. So you will create some kind of um, uh, authentication mechanism in your device. So only authorized people or um, systems can access uh, the data in your device. That's another way to solve this problem. Another way is tampering. So we have some kind of physical protection, right? So let's say uh, a thread actor uh, wants to extract the data, data from your device. Uh, you can have a, a, a tampering system where if the, the, the user or the thread actor open the device, the data inside of it will be erased. That's another way to mitigate this problem. And of course, here our main objective is encryption. So let's talk about encryption. What is encryption? It's the process of encoding information, right? So we have uh, um, the input is what we call a clear text, and the output is what we call a cipher test. And in the middle, we have a cipher that usually receives an input that we call a key, but could be any secret that will be used by the algorithm implementing the cipher to generate the output, the cipher test. So that's the, the main idea here, right? And here we have uh, both the encryption and the decryption process. This is just a, a, a simple and very known example of encryption, right? So here we have a, a cipher text. Uh, I will give you three seconds to try to identify, uh, but we could develop some kind of software to break this in three seconds. It's very easy. This is using a cipher called Caesar cipher. It's very simple, just shifting characters. Uh, we could say here that our key is minus three. So it is shifting minus three, the characters. So uh, D will become A, as we can see here, right? D will become A, E will become B, and so on. It's very simple 
cipher. Um, keys. So to generate a cipher test, we're going to need a cipher, and the cipher has some kind, some kind of secret, right? Uh, so you cannot break easily from the cipher test, discover the clear text. The, the main idea of encryption is that the cipher is public. Everyone knows how the cipher works. You don't have to hide it. If you are doing or developing your own cipher, you are doing wrong. Um, the secret will be the input to the cipher. That's usually we call a key. And there are two main types of key that um, we have the symmetric key where the same key is used for, for encryption and decryption. And we have the asymmetric key, where uh, we have basically a pair of keys, where we call a public and, pri and, and private key. Uh, you encrypt with one key and decrypt with the other key. So here we have a, a diagram of uh, a symmetric encryption using the same key, right, to encrypt and decrypt. And with the asymmetric encryption, you have two keys, one to encrypt and the other to decrypt. Um, the cipher, the algorithm, makes sure that um, you, when you encrypt with one key, you can only decrypt with the other key and vice versa. So you cannot use the same key to do both encryption and decryption. And again, I'm not going over the mathematics of this. It uses prime numbers, but we're not going over that concept. Um, the idea here is to have a, a notion as a user of how, how this works. I created a table trying to compare uh, both approaches. So with a symmetric key, symmetric key, you have one key. With a symmetric key, you have two keys. Um, the complexity of the symmetric key is lower compared to the asymmetric key. That makes the, the algorithm faster and uses using less resources. That's the opposite of asymmetric keys. The complexity is higher, it is slower, and it uses more resources. The keys for a symmetric key is um, less. The length is less, like 256 bits, uh, compared to asymmetric keys, where you have um, 2048 or, or 4096 uh, bits. Um, and usually we use symmetric keys to encrypt the large, large chunks of data, big files, and asymmetric keys just to encrypt small files, like uh, doing signatures where we encrypt a hash, for example. Um, we're going to see that they work pretty well together. Uh, so you can use an asymmetric algorithm to, to encrypt a symmetric key that's going to be used as a session key during communication. Um, so they work pretty well together, but they complement each other. The, the most used algorithm for symmetric key is AES, and for asymmetric key, we have basically two, RSA and the elliptic curve. Very nice. This was a very fast and small introduction to encryption. Uh, what I want to do now is some hands-on on encryption. So I'm going to now switch over to my terminal. Um, hopefully, you all can, can see my terminal here. Um, I'm going to use OpenSSL as a tool to uh, experiment with encryption decryption, right? Uh, don't focus much on the details. I'm going to try to explain uh, what's important here in this presentation. So I'm going to start with key generation. And this is my comment for key generation. I, I can generate a key with, like I can open a file and type ones and zeros and generate a, a binary file from it. And then I have my key with enough bits. Um, so there are many, many approaches to generate keys. Hopefully as handle as needed for, for the algorithm. Here I'm gonna use OpenSSL to generate a key, right? Um, I, I'm gonna, basically I'm gonna do this is use uh, a key derivation algorithm. That's the, the, the one. And uh, this is my passphrase, and I'm asking it to generate a key, um, uh, deriving a key from this passphrase. That's basically what I'm doing here. And I have here my key. Now I'm going to take this key and copy to a file, because I'm going to use this key uh, to encrypt and decrypt. So let's do this. So I, sorry, 
so I saved the key in the file. Nice. Now I can use it for encryption and decryption. The first test I'm going to do, I'm going to encrypt this file, uh, manifest.txt. This is a, uh, a nice article from the FRAC magazine uh, about hackers. Um, I'm going to encrypt it with uh, OpenSSL, and this is the comment. So OpenSSL encrypt, I'm going to use a yes. That's uh, the most used algorithm, algorithm for, for, for encryption. This is uh, the, the, the cipher block mode. I'm going to talk about this later. Um, I'm going to encrypt this. This is the input file. This is my key. And this is the output file. Very simple. Input, key, output, algorithm is a yes. Done. So now I have my encrypted file. I can try to open here and I'm going to see, I, I can only see garbage, right? Because it is encrypted. Nice. Um, now I'm going to decrypt it. So same command, but I have here the D for decryption. Uh, my input file is the encrypted file, dot .enc. Same key. We are doing here a symmetric encryption. And my output is the decrypted file. So let's run this. Nice. Now I can just cat the decrypted file. I'm gonna, I can see that's the basically the same file. Can even compare with the, the original file. Shouldn't must be the same file. Very nice. Now I have used it here a mode called ECB. That's a very insecure mode. So uh, AES is a, a block cipher. So it, it, it encrypts data by blocks. So it, take, it takes blocks of data and encrypt blocks. And there are, there, is, there are different ways to do this, right? How can you to like take blocks and encrypt blocks, etc.? So this is one way, ECB, and it's very insecure. I, I just want to quickly show how insecure this is uh, with another example. So I have here a picture of our lovely uh, penguin tux, right? I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna extract from, from this picture the header. I want this header. So I want to extract it. And I want to also extract this image, the body. That's the data of the image. So now I have the, 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 the header, the header in the body. I, I want to encrypt the body. So I'm going to run OpenSSL, same command, but encrypting the body. And I'm going to generate the encrypted body. That's the image encrypted, right? Nice. Now I'm going to convert back to a PPM file with the header that I extracted and the encrypted body. So in theory, this should be garbage, right? Because the body is encrypted. Yeah, let's see. Can you all see that uh, the penguin is there? So we are leaking information, right? Uh, of course, you cannot see the penguin because uh, blocks are encrypted. But because of the way ECB works, uh, it leaks information. Let me quickly show you the, the Wikipedia page that has a nice um, diagram for this. So this is how ECB works by blocks, right? So it takes a block, a plain test from a block, encrypt with a key, and generates a cipher test. So, so for the same plain test text, you're going to have the same cipher text, right? This is leaking information. So you know if you have the same cipher test, uh, in different places of the, the, the file, uh, that means that the plain test is always the same. So you are leaking a lot of information here. Uh, there are other modes, for example, the CBC that I'm, I'm going to show, show you now. The, so the CBC mode, it's, um, it's, um, it's better because um, it uses an initialization vector, IV for each encryption. So it's, it's a kind of more handle that data to the, to the encryption process. And then um, every cipher test will differ from the other, even if the plain test is the same, right? So if I use the CBC, 
um, then I'm gonna I'm gonna see garbage in the in the in the encryption process. But of course, I'm I'm gonna need this initialization vector to start the process of encryption. Um, and I, I can show you again how that would work with uh, with CBC. So let's again um, let's let me see here. Um, yeah, let's um, encrypt again with CBC. So what 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 I'm changing here is the command. It's from ECB to CBC. It's going to comply. Why? Because I, I need an initialization vector to work with, with CBC, right? Um, so I'm going to generate this initialization vector. Um, I'm going to use the random number generator from my OpenSSL. And I save it in the iv.txt file. And uh, it's really just like handle numbers. Uh, now I'm going to run the same command, but uh, encrypting with iv. Now the only difference is this one. and I can now get back the image again and see if I can how the image looks like. Now uh, we are really seeing here handle data, right? Because for every uh, encrypted block, uh, we have a different initialization vector, right? Because the cipher, the output of one block is going to be the initialization vector of the second block. And then in the end, it's, it is really handle. And um, if I, every time I encrypt, I change this initialization vector, then um, every time I encrypt this file, I'm, I'm gonna have uh, different data, right? And it's more difficult to break that. Of course, to decrypt it, you're gonna need also the initialization vector. But this is not a secret. Uh, you can share initialization vector, really, if you keep your key private. Now let's talk about asymmetric encryption. Now for asymmetric encryption, we really need two keys. So a key for encryption and a key for decryption. So I'm gonna use here OpenSSL to generate a public and private key. Uh, so here I generated this uh, priv.key file. And I, now I'm gonna ask OpenSSL to uh, output the, the private key from that. So now I have also uh, the private key. So Basically, what, what I have done here is I generated a public key and a private key. Um, so here I have uh, the private key, and I, I this really should be a secret. No one should see this. And the public key I can share with anyone. That's no problem, right? Um, now, now let's say I want to encrypt this small file, this secretoflife.txt. Uh, I want to encrypt it with RSA, I can. This is a small file. So I'm going to do this using my uh, public key, right? Uh, so I'm running here OpenSSL. Let me copy the command here. Oops, sorry. So this is the command. I'm using OpenSSL to decrypt, encrypt using RSA. This is my public key. This is the input file and the output file. Nice, encrypted. Now the file is just data, encrypted data. Let's say I want to decrypt it. Can I use the same public key for decryption? I cannot, right? So I encrypt it with the public key. I should decrypt it with the private key. So the decryption should happen with the private key. And now I can have back my, uh, my decrypted uh, file. And it's there, same content. So that's how it works. We encrypt with a public key and we decrypt with a private key. Right. Now, let's say I want to encrypt a big file. We cannot do that, right? Why we cannot do that? Because it works only, uh, RSA in specific works only with uh, uh, data that's the same size of the key. So here I have a, 
4096 bits key, uh, the data should be uh, at most this size. So in this example, let's say I want to encrypt this, what I will need to do? I will need to generate uh, uh, a private key that could be my uh, session. Let's do this. I have here the comments. I'm going to quickly do this. So let's say I want to encrypt. I, I want to, to send to some, someone uh, this uh, big file encrypted, right? But I don't want to share any secret with this person. I don't want. So how can I solve this problem? I can create a session key and encrypt it with my uh, private key. Um, and then the user that will open this file will use my public key to decrypt the key, the session, the key session, and then it will decrypt the file. Now let's do, quickly do this. So I'm going to generate here again uh, my, my private key that I will use to encrypt the file, right? Everything uh, what we are doing here, we have already done before. Uh, I'm just going to do it again. So this is my key that I will use to encrypt the file. I'm going to also create the initialization vector for the CDC encryption. So I have there my key and my initialization vector. Now I'm going to encrypt the uh, file, right? So I'm using AES-CBC. This is the file that I want to encrypt. This is my key, the initialization vector, and this is the encrypted file. Nice, file is uh, encrypted. Now I'm going to encrypt my key, the key that I use to encrypt this file. So I am using RSA. I'm going to encrypt with my uh, public key. Actually, here we could use the other way around, right? I can use here the priv key. Let's do with the, the public key, but could be also the other way around. I'm going to encrypt with the key. Uh, so I, I'm encrypting my session key with my public key. Um, and then I have the encrypted key here. Nice. Now we have these three files, right? We have the initialization vector needed to decrypt the key. We have the encrypted key and we have the encrypted file. Now, who can decrypt this? Only the one that has the private key because I encrypted the key session with the public key, right? So I could do the reverse now. So let's say someone, uh, so in this specific example, what's happened is that someone is trying to send me an encrypted file, right? So this person uh, took my uh, public key to encrypt a uh, session key, encrypted the file with the session key and sent me the, the encrypted file and the encrypted key, right? And the initialization vector so I can decrypt the key. So what I will do now is first decrypt the key and then with the key, that's the session key, I decrypt the file. And now I have back the decrypted file with the content. So that's basically how, for example, TLS works. That's what we're going to mention later. Uh, and that's how, how it works. And that's one of the usefulness of asymmetric key encryption. It's slow, uses a lot of research. So you, you need to focus on the small data with asymmetric cryptography. Um, but you can, for example, exchange keys with, with it. That's very nice. Let's get back to our presentation now. I hope this hands was um, was useful. Um, we have more things to talk about now. Um, data at rest encryption. So now let's focus on the embedded Linux device. Um, let's say I, I want to encrypt data that's stored in the device. We have basically two approaches. We have uh, we can do full disk encryption or we can uh, do file-based encryption. For full disk encryption, we have DMCrypt. That's a device mapper um, target from the kernel. Um, and uh, you can enable and use it. Um, it's going to be basically a layer between the block, Linux block layer and uh, between a block device and the file system layer. 
So every read or write to a file system will generate uh, calls to this layer that will do the encryption and encryption on the fly. That's one way to work with encryption. The other way to work with encryption on a better Linux is to do uh, data at rest. Um, so it's to use uh, uh, a tool that will uh, encrypt files inside a file system or directories. So you can also work at the file system level instead of working at the block level. Uh, the two main approaches, uh, the two most used approaches are uh, FScript and eCryptFS. Uh, um, I'm gonna do a, a quick hands-on here with uh, FScript. So let's first talk uh, a little bit more about those two approaches. Uh, the encrypt, the encrypt it's a transparent disk encryption system for, for Linux. It's implemented at the, the kernel level and, and there are user space tools for you to configure this. Um, it is basically, as I mentioned, a layer um, on top of the block device. Uh, so it's between the block device and the file system. And that's uh, more or less what is represented by, by this diagram. So every read and write in the file system uh, will be intercepted by uh, the encrypt that will do the encryption on the fly. And um, this is a quick and dirty way to enable the encrypt. It's not that hard. And that's one thing that I want to demystify here. It's not really that hard. We're going to do it in a moment in the terminal. Um, so it will require some kernel configuration, the config, the encrypt, and also some tools. Um, you have to format the disk or the partition. And uh, the most common format that we use is Lux. Linux Unified Key Setup, it's open uh, and standard. Uh, it's not really Linux related, can be used in other uh, kernels, um, but it's really uh, used on, on Linux systems. And um, I'm going to talk about those comments uh, in a second in, a, in my hands on. This is the quick and dirt way to enable um, encryption at the block level on Linux. FScript is another way to do it. It's basically an API that is implemented by a few file systems like X4, F2FS, uh, and it works at the file system level. Basically, you define a directory and it will encrypt or decrypt everything that is within that directory. Again, you have to enable uh, an option in the kernel and uh, you have some user space tools. You need some user space tools to, to work um, and configure directory with encryption. I'm going to also explain those comments right now in my uh, second hands-on. So let's do it. Um, here I have a console. Um, basically, I build a pretty small um, image with, um, with build root. Uh, I have here, um, first of all, I'm running um, on a Teradex module, uh, Apalis IMX6. And uh, I built this small uh, build root system to do some tests on encryption. So I have really here um, almost nothing running in user space, as you can see. Um, I have a few tools to, to work with encryption. And I'm also doing network boot. So I'm booting the kernel and the root file system via networking, so it's easier. Uh, to change the system and do development. Nice. Let's let's do some um, some tests here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, the encrypt. Um, let's start since we don't have much time. I could spend here a half an hour to to show a lot of details about this. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do two hands-on here um, encrypting uh, a partition with encrypt and uh, encrypting our directory with FScript. So let's see how it works. Um, let's, let's start with, uh, with encrypt. So I have here connected in the module, I have um, a pen drive with a few partitions. We can see here those SDA1, 2, 3, 4. Those are four partitions inside my pen drive. I'm gonna work with SDA4. And um, I'm going to first configure the encrypt to uh, encrypt the full partition. So how that works? First, I need a key. 
So I'm gonna generate this key right now in my device. Can you see the same comment that I ran the device in the in my machine? I'm running here uh, in the device. So I'm going. I'm creating an AES key. I'm gonna save it in a in a file. This key. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about key management because, of course, you should not have a, a key dot preview file uh, stored in a file system, right? Uh, the security of your encryption is uh, as good as the way you save the, the the private keys. So it's important to care about that. We're gonna talk a, bit, a little bit about this later. We're not caring about this now. Now I'm gonna use a crypt setup to configure the partition. So crypt setup, I'm gonna use Lux as a format for the partition to store encrypted files. And this is my encryption key. Should take a few seconds to format this partition. After that, what I'm gonna do is uh, open access to this uh, partition. So to open access, I need this key. So this is very important. Um, and of course, I should take this key from some secure place. But for now, I'm not care about this. What I'm asking here, crypto setup, is to uh, create a, a, a virtual block device called a data gear. Uh, map it to this physical block device uh, that is using uh, the encrypt, right? for encryption. Now I can format. So I have here this um, virtual block device here. It's a device mapper device. I can format with MKFS64. It should also take a few seconds. Let's wait. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Nice, formatted, I can mount uh, in any directory in my file sheet. I'm mounting on the slash data. So now I have here in slash data, an encrypted mounted file system. So um, let's, for example, um, create a file here. Um, so I don't know, uh, touch hello inside slash data slash sorry touch data hello nice so this file is encrypted and i can of course write to it and every operation that i'm doing inside this directory is is encrypted right and uh, now let's let's reboot the device so i'm gonna reboot here Should also take a few seconds to boot, hopefully not too much. I'm doing network boot here. So it will take the kernel from, from uh, networking using um, TFTP, and then it will boot the file system uh, via um, NFS. should drop the console in a second okay so now i'm gonna log in again and um, yeah so let's say now I, I want to so of course it's not mounted anymore right the data it's it's empty uh this is from the pre from a previous test let let me remove it um so the data is empty we don't have anything mounted there of course i cannot do this right mount slash dev sda4 uh, on data, because data is really not formatted within file system. It is, it is encrypted. The sorry, the SD SD4. Uh, what what I need to do to um, access the that uh, uh, encrypted partition, I have to run again a crypto setup and open access to that partition. So the same command that I ran before. Of course, I need again a key. So if I'm doing this automatically at the boot time, I would have to recover this key from somewhere and then uh, use it to uh, open the access to the partition. And then it should take a few seconds. Now I can mount the generated uh, virtual block device, data gear, in slash data. 
and now I can uh, access the uh, my file, my hello file uh, that is encrypted, right? So, so that's how it works. So here I'm doing uh, full disk encryption, and that's how it works in Android, uh, in Ubuntu. If you enable it, like um, full disk encryption for the the home uh, directory. Um, uh, if you have home in a specific partition, you can do this using the encrypt. The other way to work with encryption um, is using FScript. So let's quickly go over it. So we have time to go over the last session of the presentation. Um, encrypting a directory. Uh, the first thing you need to do is format the partition with this option, encrypt. That's the first thing you need to do. OK, uh, let's, let's reboot. Because um, we have uh, SDA4 uh, mounted, already mounted, and using Lux, let's let's reboot to reformat it with the encrypt option. You could also use TuneFS to change the the partition and uh, enable the encrypt option. But but I'm gonna do it here from scratch, format and do from scratch here. Okay, we are there. Um, so yeah, let me run again the format. Let me format again the, the partition with the encrypt option. Should again take a few seconds. Good. Now we can mount this partition. This is a standard X4 partition. I'm mounting on slash uh, dash slash data. Now I'm going to create a directory inside there, call it secrets. And I'm going to encrypt it. So I'm going to generate a key. Again, here I'm using another way to generate a key, right? Uh, uh, taking data from your handle, just as, a, as an example. So this is my key to the secret. Uh, first thing you need to do is to add this key to the key ring. That's a, a, a ring buffer of keys in the system. So for that, we're going to use this tool, FS Crypt Control. Um, it generates me a uh, descriptor for this key. Then I'm going to use this descriptor to configure a policy for a directory. So I'm saying that this directory should be encrypted with this key. That's it. From now on, everything that I do in this directory will be encrypted. So if I do this, here we can see some uh, messages from the kernel, the algorithm that is, it is using, AESBC, um, but it is encrypted. Now, if I like data secrets, right? I can see right the the secrets there. Um, I can even, of course, boot it. Now, let's say let's reboot. Let's make sure that this is really, really encrypted. Uh, if it is encrypted, the slash data is slash secrets. Uh, should be invisible, or uh, we should see garbage there, right? Because um, we need a key to decrypt the content there. Let's see how this works. Okay, so I'm gonna mount the partition again, mount it. Uh, if I list the content there, what's going to happen? garbage so the, the the content of the file is encrypted and also the uh, file name um, so everything inside this directory is encrypted um, you cannot see even the file name the, the name of the files that you have there now to use this again i will have again to take my key insert the key ring and then 
set the policy with the correct key. So now I can again read the data and the, the directory. So every boot, I will need to do this. Take the key from somewhere, add to the key ring, and set the policy so that key can be used for, for decryption on that specific directory. It's not that hard, it's not that difficult, right? The only problem here is where should we store this key? So we should really um, care about this, right? Where to store the key? It should be in a secret place uh, where no one has access to, even you, right? Should be really, really secret. But of course, not, it should be, you should be able also to extract the key at runtime to do the decryption. So uh, what are the possibilities here? Um, you could use some research from the processor. Uh, for example, CAM uh, is a, a module from IMX um, SOCs from XP. You could use that. Um, that is a, a master key inside the, the CAM module. You could use the master key to encrypt your key. So the idea would be when you boot, uh, you generate a key for encryption. The first boot, the first ever boot of the device could be in production. You uh, generate a key, then you use the, the master key from the CAM module that's unique per device to encrypt that key and save in your device. And then on every boot, you would uh, take this encrypt key and ask at runtime uh, the CAM module to decrypt it for you so you can use it to decrypt the partition. That's how it would work in this specific case. Uh, if you don't have any resources in the hardware, you could use some external hardware. Like if you don't have resources in the processor, in the SOC, you could use uh, external hardware, like a, a secure element or a TPM for that. Um, the idea is the same, right? To use uh, an external engine to do this kind of uh, secure storage for you. Um, a secure element is a very popular uh, hard device. So SIM cards are secure elements. Uh, smart cards are secure elements. But they are not so, I uh, would say, uh, popular on embedded devices. On embedded devices, I, at least from my previous experience, TPM, TPM um, devices are more popular. And, uh, but in the end, you could do the same with both store secrets and use it to, um, uh, to decrypt your key for uh, disk encryption. That would be the idea. Another way would be to use a trusted execution environment. So if you are uh, developing on ARM, you have, for example, trust zone there, you could uh, use a trusted execution environment uh, like OPTE uh, to, to restore secrets in the, in the device. That could be another, another way. I'm not go go over the detail the details of this, but I want to mention uh, a few options to uh, store secrets in the device. You can use resources from the SOC. You can have a, a, an external hardware like a TPM, or you could even even use a trusted execution environment for that. Very nice. Uh, we are kind of uh, out of time here um, in our presentation. I have uh, a few minutes. Um, I'm gonna quickly. Uh, cover the last session, data in transit encryption. Here is very simple. You want to encrypt uh, data that you want to send or receive from a, a remote machine. Um, there are basically two approaches here. Um, you can use VPNs for that. If you want to encrypt the full communication, right? You, you want an encrypted tunnel, uh, you can use a VPN for that. So we have uh, IPsec. It's a uh, uh, protocol suit that you can use for to create uh, an encrypted tunnel. You can use OpenVPN, is a, um, a user space software that uses OpenSSL and TLS to create encrypted tunnels. A more modern approach is WireGuard, another um, um, uh, implementation of VPN at kernel space, very fast, very focused on embedded, very nice. If you don't know, I would suggest you to have a look at at WireGuard. Now, if you want to just encrypt communication between one application to a server, usually we use TLS for that. Um, sometimes people uh, uh, say SSL, but they are, they really mean TLS. That's the, the newer version or, or the successor of SSL, right? And uh, specifically on embedded devices, uh, it is recommended to use MTLLs, mutual TLLs. The, the main difference is that with TLS, 
the client uh, authenticates the server, right? So when I'm here in my browser and connect to Google, my browser, for example, Firefox, we will authenticate Google to see if I'm really talking to Google using certificates. Now with MTLS, the server will also authenticate the client. So in an embedded solution where you have like a serving, a server where you communicate, it's important for the server to know that is talking to the correct client. So you will want a server to authenticate the client and, and there we use also MTLS. This is a kind of a diagram explaining uh, TLS in a nutshell. So in blue, we have basically the TCP connection and in, in, in green, we have the TLS connection. So the client sends a hello world message saying, hey, I'm this client, I support this uh, version of the protocol with these ciphers and so on. And then the server will reply, nice, so let's do this. Let's use this protocol with this cipher. The server can also ask for a certificate and the client will send the certificate. And then the client will create a kind of pre-master key for communication. And it will use the public key of the server to encrypt this uh, pre-master key and send to the server. So only the server will be able to decrypt and uh, find out the, the pre-master key because um, it needs the private key for that and only the server has the private key. And then when both has this private, the pre-master key, then they will generate another key who is using a key derivation algorithm for that. And that key will be the session key for communication. And then they will exchange the finished messages to make sure everyone is talking with the same key and then they start communicating with each other. So we can see that there is a algorithm here for key exchange and they use asymmetric cryptography to exchange keys. And after that, they use symmetric cryptography, um, the, the session key, uh, for real encryption of data. Very nice. I had a, a final uh, hands-on here uh, with some uh, demonstrations on how MTLS works. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so um, as soon as this is online and um, the conference is over, what I'm going to do, I'm going to publish an article on embeddedbits.org about all of these with all of the comments and explanations. So for those that like, those that like a more documented uh, approach uh, for of how all this works, uh, I'm going to uh, write a blog post about it. So so just follow, follow my blog and uh, it will be there. Um, a few weeks probably after after the conference is, is over. So Thanks a lot for your time. I really hope you enjoyed this, this presentation. I, and I really uh, hope that I could demystify a little bit um, how encryption works and how can you um, apply encryption on embedded development. Uh, those are my uh, contacts again, my blog, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, feel free to connect. And um, yeah. Thank you all and uh, until next time, bye-bye.